Good morning. Happy Easter. I'm Bill Miller. This is Redeemer Evangelical Covenant Church in Liverpool, New York. And we are glad you're here. Uh, this is Easter, Easter Sunday celebration. Uh, also, we are going to take communion today. So if you're watching and you want to be a part of our communion service, then uh, sometime before we take communion in about 15 or 20 minutes, you might want to get a cracker and some juice or some bread and some water. Whatever you have available will work just fine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that we can meet, even virtually, with each other. Father, we know that your church has never been a building. Your church has always been those people who love you. So, Father, we are here to worship you. We are here to celebrate your resurrection. I pray that everyone who is watching this right now would be blessed by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
alive. You know, there were three major moves of God in relation to the human race. Uh, he started our history by creating everything, and when he put us in his creation, we messed it up. We did the one thing he asked us not to do, and sin entered the world. And then we separated ourselves from him because of what we did. <clears throat> Centuries later, God once again intervened in human history when Jesus came. Christmas, he came to Bethlehem. Uh, he spent three years discipling his disciples and apostles, and the culmination of his visit was that we nailed him to a cross. And God took that sacrifice that he made as a payment for everything we had done wrong, past, present, and future. And that separation that happened in the Garden of Eden was completely healed, and once again we can join with the God who created us. The third and final intervention in the human race will be when Jesus comes back again. And that's what we look forward to. Everything that he created, everything that we have lived in for the last thousands of years is going to be destroyed and a new heaven and a new earth is going to be created and forever and ever those who are in Christ will be with him for eternity. The Bible says that when we take communion <clears throat> which is symbolic of the body of Christ that was broken for us on the cross and the blood of Christ that was spilled on the cross for us, for our salvation. When we take communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's not just a little thing we do once in a while. It's not something that just builds unity in churches. It is a declaration. It is us shouting from spiritual hilltops that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for all of us. And once we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, we join with all those who are in Christ, and he is in us. So we take communion this morning in a celebration of what he's done for us.
know, last week, uh, it was our second Facebook Live service, and I introduced uh, gopher stories. These are stories that I originally made up as I was putting my two oldest children to bed many, many years ago. Some of them I've written since then, but most of them came from that period. And uh, I usually, on Sunday morning, have the kids come up, and one of them will hold this little gopher, which was made for me by Glenn Schwarm in Millersburg, Ohio. I'm thankful to Glenn. Uh, this is sort of his idea of what the father in the gopher stories would look like, and I agree. The gopher stories are mostly about uh, a young gopher named Gilly Gally and his little sister Silly Sally, and today's story is about Easter. It says, once upon a time there was a town called Gopherville, and in Gopherville there was a gopher named Gilly Gally. It was Easter Sunday in Gopherville, and Gilly Gally's church was having an Easter egg hunt. He and Silly Sally were waiting in their Sunday school room. The teachers were soon going to let the kids out into the yard to find the eggs. Silly Sally asked Gilly Gally, Why do we have Easter egg hunts on Easter? Well, the egg represents a new life. It's supposed to remind us of when Jesus rose from the dead. Why is there chocolate inside? Um, because being a Christian is really sweet. <laughs> and why do we all have bags to put the eggs in? Silly Sally was going through her why phase. She was asking a lot of questions starting with why. Her family decided to try to answer her questions as best they could and not to scold her for asking so many questions. So why do we go to church on Sunday? To worship God and hear about Jesus. Why doesn't the Easter Bunny come to church? The Easter Bunny is made up, he's not real. Then why does he bring all those eggs? He doesn't bring the eggs, he's not real. Then who brings them? One of the adults, I think. What is Easter again? It's when we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? Because he was stronger than death. Gilly Gally had just remembered that from church. Then why did he have to die in the first place? Because God wanted to be friends with us. He wanted to be our father, but we wanted to do only what we wanted to do. So we got separated. Then Jesus came from heaven and lived the kind of life we were supposed to live, and we killed him. He deserved good things, and we gave him bad things. But he let it all happen so we could get the good things when we really deserved the bad things. Good things like chocolate, said Silly Sally. Yes, and heaven and happiness. We get to be God's children, just like he always wanted it to be. Just then, they opened the doors and let the kids out into the yard. They were allowed to find three eggs, and it took Silly Sally a long time because she was one of the youngest gophers in church. She had to look all the way at the edge of the yard to find her last egg. When they got home, they opened their eggs and started eating the chocolate. Their father and mother had to help Silly Sally open her eggs because her hands were very small and the eggs were a little tricky. You try first, said father. If she couldn't get it, then he would help her. On her last egg, she was having a really hard time. This one won't open, she said in a frustrated voice. Let me try, said her father. Then he stopped. Her mother said, can you get it, or do you need me to help you? She was talking to Silly Sally's father and making a joke. Her father handed the egg to her mother. I don't think you'll be able to open this one, he said with a smile. Oh my, she said, because it was a real bird egg. Silly Sally had found a real bird egg. Maybe it fell out of a tree onto the ground. Should we keep it, mother asked. Silly Sally blurted out, of course, let's help it be born. They decided to help it be born. They put it under a light to keep it warm, and they watched it day after day. And after two days, Gilly Gally's family thought it was dead, and they were beginning to think they shouldn't have kept it at all. But on the third day, Silly Sally came running into the kitchen. Our baby bird is coming out. I saw it move. And sure enough, the little baby bird was pecking against the egg, and after a little bit of a struggle, it poked its head out. Look, he's just like Jesus. Silly Sally was very excited, but her parents looked at each other. How is he like Jesus, her mother asked. The baby bird was in the tomb, and then he busted out. Happy birthday, happy Easter, baby bird. She was very excited. Happy Easter, baby bird. This went on for a long time. Gilly Gally and Silly Sally went into the woods and found little word, worms to feed the baby bird, which they decided to call Baby Bird because they didn't know what names birds really liked. And after a few weeks, Baby Bird was starting to fly. 
First, he'd fly around the house and come back to his place in the kitchen. And then one day, the family took him outside, and he flew around the yard three times and then flew away. Silly Sally was happy and sad when Baby Bird left. The whole family waved goodbye and said, good luck to Baby Bird as he flew away. And then Silly Sally whispered, happy Easter, Baby Bird, the end. Yeah, I'd like to encourage you, uh, especially if you're a member of our church already, we have a website. It's www.myredeemer.com. And if you are so inclined, there's a button on that website where you can give uh, straight online. And we really would love for you to do something like that. All right, I want to talk to you about Easter, obviously. And Easter is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the most important decision that we make, I believe, in life is deciding how we are going to respond to his resurrection. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, please open our hearts, open our minds, open even our spirits to you and your Holy Spirit. Father, we are thankful for what Jesus did on the cross for us. We are thankful that he destroyed death physically, visibly, by rising up from the tomb on Easter. Father, I pray that every word I say would be anointed by your Spirit, that you would help me to leave out the things that need to be left out and put in the things that need to be put in. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's start with Romans chapter 1, verse 4. And by the way, uh, there, are, there are copies of all the verses I'm going to use today and some blanks you can fill in. Uh, they may have been emailed to you if we have your email address, and you can probably also find them either on our Facebook page or on our website. So Romans 1.4 says, Jesus, through the spirit of holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to look at four people whose stories are given in the Bible and how they responded to the resurrection. I want to start with someone named Cleopas, someone you may not have heard, in, heard of. Uh, Cleopas was someone without hope. If you're filling in the blanks, what goes in this blank is hope. This is a story from Luke 24. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But he, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what had said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was talking with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. When the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So, from this story, 
How did Cleopas respond to the resurrection? He acknowledged the cry of his soul. You're filling in the blanks. It's soul. He acknowledged the cry of his soul. And they didn't know about the cry of their soul until after. All right, second, I want to look at Thomas. And you might recognize Thomas. Yeah, he made famous the phrase doubting Thomas because he was a doubter. In fact, I call him a skeptic. In John 20, it says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the, with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. So how did Thomas respond to the resurrection? He acknowledged the truth of who Jesus is. The third person is Mary Magdalene. Starting in Luke 8, I want to read a couple of different passages to describe who Mary was. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. This is who Mary Magdalene was before she met Jesus. She was cured of Holy Spirits and diseases because she had seven demons in her, and Jesus had to cast them out. Mary was a sinner. My guess is that everybody knew her and knew her as a sinner. But once she was saved by Christ, once the demons were cast out, once she was cured of the diseases and all that, she followed him. I'm skipping now to John 20, because Mary Magdalene, if you're filling in the blanks, a sinner. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot, and they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. You know, I sometimes wondered why in both of these stories they didn't recognize who Jesus was. And I have no excuse for Cleopas and his friend on the road. But I have a feeling that Mary may have been crying at the tomb. And as she cried, her eyes may have been so full of tears that when the person shows up, she thinks, oh, who is that? Oh, it must be the gardener. That's who's supposed to be here. And it was only when Jesus said her name, which he had probably said dozens of times previous, that she suddenly realized who it was. Her eyes may have been blinded, but she knew in her spirit and her soul when she heard him say her name, who it was. How did she respond to the resurrection? She acknowledged her need for Jesus. It's interesting to me that Mary, probably when she figured out who it was, grabbed hold of Jesus like she never wanted to let him go. He had to say, stop holding on to me, I haven't gone to the Father yet. All right, the last person I want to talk about is Peter, the Apostle Peter. I call him a broken disciple. From Mark 14, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. 
I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself, yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. This is who Peter was. As you read through the Bible, especially uh, in the Gospels, even the book of Acts, and you read about Peter, he is all go. And he was the one who chopped off a, a soldier's servant's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane trying to protect Jesus. He was the one that walked on the water uh, when Jesus was walking on water. He is just, just full of passion. And in this moment when Jesus says, listen, uh, they're going to take me and I'm going to be crucified. Peter's full of passion. No, I will die for you. I will die before I let that happen. And Jesus said, no, actually, tonight you're going to disown me three times. And you'll know that you have and that I knew it ahead of time because you're going to hear a rooster crow. I'm skipping now to Mark chapter 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came in. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Can you imagine a man so full of passion, making such declarations that he would die for Jesus, and then when the time actually comes, he denies him three times. And if that weren't enough, he realized in that moment that Jesus had known ahead of time that he would deny him. How broken a man that must have been. I'm going to John 21. After Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. And if I were to continue reading about this story, he gets to shore and Jesus is cooking breakfast, and he feeds Peter. And I think for a while it was just Jesus and Peter, while the other disciples were rowing their boat in and kept taking all the fish in that was so heavy. And I can only imagine that conversation between Peter and Jesus. How Peter must have apologized and, and just realized that, that he had done the one thing he didn't want to do. And Jesus must have said, Peter, you are forgiven. And the picture that I just can't get out of my mind is Peter and the look that must have been on his face when John said, it is the Lord, and he throws off his coat and dives into the water. How did Peter respond to the resurrection? He leapt to Jesus. So here's what I want to ask you. Do you see some of yourself in any or all of these four people? Do you feel sometimes like you are a person without hope, like Cleopas? That things may not be going so well in life, that you are not on top of everything right now, that you thought you were awesome, but maybe you figured out you weren't, and then the thing that you may have put your hope in suddenly falls out, and you are a person without hope. My suggestion is, 
Do what Cleopas said. Acknowledge the cry of your soul. And this may require you to sit still, to pray and say, God, I need a revelation of who you are. I need to feel your Holy Spirit in me. I need you to come and save me because I am without hope. And when you do that, I promise you, you will feel the cry of your soul. Perhaps you're a skeptic. Perhaps you got a great education and you were told that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses and religion is for people that need a crutch. And so as a skeptic, you say, I don't believe anything that I can't prove. Well, I would suggest taking a good look at the Bible. You may have ignored it because some professor might have told you to, or some friends may have made fun of it, or you yourself would have just thought, this is a fable book, there's nothing here. But when you start to read it, something will happen. Truth will be lifted off the pages of Scripture, and you will see it, maybe in your heart first, but eventually even in your mind, that everything Christianity espouses really is true. And when you figure that out, you will want to acknowledge the truth of who Jesus is. There is nothing you can say about Jesus except one of two things. Either he is the Savior of the world, the Son of God who saved us, or he was a complete fraud. You can't say, oh, he was a good man, because he said, I am the Son of God. And a good man wouldn't claim to be the Son of God if he wasn't. You can't say, oh, he was a prophet, and that's all. Because again, prophets don't say they're the Son of God. Only the Son of God says he's the Son of God, or a crazy person. So the truth has to be one of those two things. Either he is who he said he was, he is who he says he is, or he's nothing to be thought about. Finally, well, let's move on to Mary. You know, uh, before I became a Christian, I was 15 years old when I made a commitment to Christ. I was a sinner. I was just like Mary Magdalene. I had done things in my life that I thought, well, these were maybe enjoyable at the time, but this is not what I was made for. This is not what God wants for my life. I knew that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And no matter what you've done in life, it may be that you have some little sins that you think about, maybe even something yesterday. Or it may be that you have sinned so bad that you've gone to prison. Or you have hurt someone so bad you can't even think about it anymore. But I'll tell you, each one of us is a sinner. And there just is no variation of sin. There isn't those who have sinned a little and those who have sinned a lot. Sin is sin, and all of us are named that way. So I would suggest, if you realize that you're a sinner, acknowledge that you have a need for Jesus, a need for the Savior. I know I did. I know everyone who's ever become a Christian at some point acknowledges who they are and who Jesus is. Finally, I want to end with Peter, a broken disciple. Some of you may have made a commitment to Christ at some point in your life, or maybe you went to church as a child. Maybe you went to Sunday school and learned all the stories. Maybe you heard preachers talk about who Jesus was. And maybe at some point you said, oh, I, I think I'd like to become a Christian, or, or maybe you made that commitment to Christ, and then you've just fallen back. The, the cares of this world, the things that that encroach on all of our lives, have just gotten your attention and gotten your soul. And if that's the case, I would encourage you, come back to Jesus. He has been waiting for you. If you know the story of the prodigal son, his father waits for the son to return, and as the son is approaching over the hill, the father runs to him and puts his arms around him. That is how God has been waiting for you. No matter how, how bad you've ever been, no matter how far you've run away from God, he has been waiting for you all this time. My suggestion is do what Peter did. Once you figure out what you need, jump out of the boat. Don't row it to shore. Don't worry about the fish. Jump into the water to get to Jesus as quickly as you can. And you'll find out that he's been waiting for you the whole time. I want to end with 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Because this is Easter, and the Easter message really is that we have a living hope. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade 
kept in heaven for you. This is the promise that what I've been talking about, coming to Jesus, carries with it not just the, the acknowledgement that you've made a decision, but it carries a new life, a living hope, a promise of eternity with him, a promise that through his grace and your faith, there is a relationship that will never be broken again. I would encourage you even right now, if you've never done business with God, pray and say, God, I'm ready. I'm sorry I took so long. Let's pray together. Father, you are awesome. You are the one who made us. You're the one who saved us, and you're the one who's coming back for us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. We pray that everyone within the sound of my voice would recognize who you are and run to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a happy Easter.